Hello everyone and welcome to the first lecture in our second unit in which we'll be talking about genre, a term that, like literacy, you may have been familiar with before taking the class, but I'd like to talk about it in what's possibly a new way for you. So the dictionary would tell you that genres are types, kinds, and forms, um, and I would say that this is um, a slightly more simplistic way of thinking of genre than we're used to and a way of thinking about genre that's a little bit uh, uh, older. And we're going to be talking instead about the ways in which rhetorical theorists have started talking about genre within the past uh, 10, 20 years. So typically when we think of genres, we think of things like um, the different sections of the movie store, you know, the horror movies and the comedy movies, or the different ways in which we can start to classify writing. So that's probably the ways in which you've thought about genre or um, ways in which it's been talked about um, in the past if you've taken um, English courses or perhaps courses in other subject areas. Um, when we think of genre in this way as being divided into, say, horror or comedy or drama um, at the video store, um, this is um, sometimes a way of defining a, a genre by its formal characteristics, um, as in kind of how it looks, what's, what's included in it. Um, and it's viewed as a way to classify different, different uh, texts. Um, and that's evident by the fact that if you walk into the CD store, um, they use, you know, they talk about different music genres um, in order to be able to throw CDs into one section of the store. But um, as some of you may well know, sometimes with some artists, you may go to one section thinking you'll find it there, and instead you've found that the music store has classified it in a different way. Um, so sometimes classifying it merely by um, the way it looks or sounds um, can be a bit comp complex and um, potentially a bit simplistic. Um, so while genres do have formal characteristics and patterns, this doesn't fully tell the story of how they're used and how they're written. So what genre theory has done is it's moved from defining um, genre uh, in, in terms of its formal characteristics and instead has turned to looking at how genres are used. So instead of looking merely at the person composing a text, looking at the person using or reading um, or, or consuming in some way that text. Um, so it's, it's much more interested in action and use. So um, ideas I'd like to kind of uh, get you started to think about and the reading and the second lesson of this unit, lesson two, when you read um, Irene Clark talk about writing prompts and assignments, um, some of this will uh, be made clearer, I hope. But I want you to think about the fact that genres shape our interactions with others, um, organize um, our ways of being, um, so organize ourselves, our identities, um, how we do things. Um, and they kind of put us into certain roles um, and sometimes uh, draw boundaries, um, sometimes uh, open up new possibilities and are places of action. So I'm gonna talk, I, I'm gonna give a couple examples in just a minute that help explain these ideas. Um, but those are a couple main ideas to take away. So, Genre classifications, um, you know, I gave the example of um, a CD in the CD store. So one of my favorite bands um, from high school was the band Nickel Creek. And they kind of, you know, sometimes they would cover Bob Dylan songs, sometimes they would cover rock songs, sometimes they uh, performed classical music, they were primarily a bluegrass band. You know, when I walk into the CD store, it's kind of hard for me to find that text sometimes. Um, and so I, I, use, I, I say this to emphasize that sometimes a text can belong to more than one genre. Um, and so if we kind of consider its use, we can kind of consider the ways in which genres for text can overlap. Um, and sometimes are you know, dictated according to who's kind of looking at that text and who is the one um, doing the defining. Two separate people might kind of define how a text is being used in different ways. Um, lastly, and perhaps most importantly, um, I, I want to get across the idea that genres are responses to recurring situations and contexts. Um, so to, to move to an example, um, if we take a look at a syllabus, and here I'll actually go back a slide so we can kind of go through each of these bullet points one by one. Okay, so I'm going to go back. So genres shape our interactions with others, and this kind of has to do with this third bullet point as well, that they organize into roles and dictate what's possible. So let's take the example of our class syllabus. The class syllabus as a document kind of, um, it, it 
organizes us into roles, me the teacher and you the students, um, by virtue of the way that it's written, the kinds of uh, information that's included. For instance, it includes policies um, and rules. And in the social situation of our class, um, it's intended to be, part of its purpose is to serve as a contract. Um, it lays out the parameters for the course, and by choosing to remain enrolled in the course, you're, you're implicitly accepting those, those parameters as, as a sort of contract for the course. Um, and so in those ways, it kind of um, puts you into the role of a student and puts you into the role of a student who's expected to act in certain ways. So it sets up the expectations for how you as a student work. Um, and you also have expectations for um, when you turn to that document. So if we go to the next slide for a minute. Again, genres are responses to recurring situations and contexts. So um, a genre the genre of the syllabus is um, an expected genre in the recurring context of taking a course. So every time you take a course, you expect there to be a syllabus there. And you would probably be surprised if you walked into a college classroom and there was no kind of syllabus. Sometimes they look different, um, but I bet you've had a course before where, especially if you're the kind of person who really likes to read those closely and know what's expected of you, perhaps there's been a time where you were kind of annoyed because the syllabus didn't give you a certain kind of information you were looking for. Um, perhaps it didn't tell you about absence policies for attendance. Um, perhaps it didn't tell you um, what the teacher's uh, preferences are for um, turning submitting work, you know, whether it should be turned in on Blackboard. Um, perhaps it didn't make clear what the required materials are or what the required prerequisites are for the course. Um, so these are conventions of the genre. Um, it, it, there, there are patterns that occur in most every syllabus. Um, and they're, they're part of this recognizable recurring situation of a classroom setting. Um, so that's a really quick, brief example of a couple of the ways in which we can start to break down how a genre works. Um, and so a syllabus is something that perhaps looks slightly different from class to class, but functions in much the same way. And so we can define, we can say that, you know, all the syllabi from those summer courses you're taking right now, for instance, all fall into the genre of a syllabus, even if they have different fonts. Um, you know, some of them might have a table of contents. Um, some of them, like mine, might not. Um, you know, even though they might have some slightly different formal characteristics, they all serve a, a similar or perhaps even the very same kind of use function. And so we can define them as a syllabus based on the way in which they're used and the ways in which they organize us into our roles and the ways in which we act in the class. Um, another example you might think about is a greeting card. Okay, so greeting cards are a recognizable response to a recurring situation. Um, if somebody graduates, it's pretty expected that um, you will respond, or you know, let's say you know somebody getting married, it's um, kind of expected for you to respond to that event in somebody's life if you're close enough with them by sending them a greeting card um, or a congratulations card of some kind. Um, they also kind of, um, you know, create realities and create social contexts as well. So just as the social context kind of gives rise to the genre, okay, so here um, with a greeting card, perhaps the social context like an event, a graduation or wedding gives rise to the card. Um, the card also sometimes creates situations as well. So for instance, um, holidays like Secretary's Day or Boss's Day, those are holidays that, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to say that they're recognized in many other ways, but something that, like a greeting card helps to make that, that uh, helps to make that more of a, more of an actual um, day. I'm, and I apologize for the background. Um, I'm outside. I'm trying to find a quiet place to, to record this and it's hard. So I'm sorry for the intrusion there. But so the greeting card helps to kind of sanction or make official a day like Secretary's Day. Um, and you, there are some cards, like a congratulations card, um, can work for several different overlapping situations. Um, and some cards could be classified in several different ways. Um, so even though they try to kind of label them at the store, this is a thank you card, this is a congrats card, sometimes one card can serve several different functions and so therefore has some overlapping genre characteristics. Um, and they also kind of dictate or make possible or, or make visible the kinds of social uh, relationships we have with each other. Um, you know, they have birthday card from wife or from son. Um, those, are, those are cards that say, um, that, that kind of make clear what your role is and kind of make you and the receiver fall into different roles. 
Okay, so again, those were, two, those were two examples, the syllabus and the greedy card, of genres that we can look at and analyze according to how they're used and how they kind of shape social interactions. Um, and so you might think about this, you know, all, with all kinds of texts, a groceries list, um, a grocery list, a doctor's office uh, form. Um, these are all typified responses to recurring situation. We write grocery lists when the pantry's empty and we need to go shopping. Um, and they serve certain purposes and functions. They're recognizable for doing so. And they kind of organize us into certain roles and kind of dictate the kind of response we have to that situation. Um, so if you send um, one of your roommates or um, a spouse or partner uh, to the grocery store with the list and um, it might kind of dictate the kinds of actions they take. Perhaps you say in this list, for instance, it just says burgers. It doesn't say what brand of burger, whether to buy fresh or frozen. Um, some of that might be, um, you know, part of the rhetorical situation. Perhaps you know that the person reading the list will understand what kind of burgers your household prefers, but perhaps that's also, um, you know, in some cases constraining what's possible or making new things possible, right? Some of these items might either limit choices that the person reading the list will make or maybe open choices that the person reading the list will make. Um, so here, and I, I, I don't know that I'll read all of these, but these are a couple major thinkers that have, um, whose work um, has influenced me in my scholarship and that I've drawn on to put together this PowerPoint. Um, and all of them have kind of helped to, so all of them have kind of helped to develop the kinds of ideas here. Carolyn Miller, Amy Devitt, and Anise Bawarshi. And they kind of look at um, recurring typified, uh, recurring situations and, and um, typical actions in response to it. Um, the ways in which, uh, the context and the genre have a reciprocal relationship right, that goes both backwards and forwards. So they both kind of help create each other, the context and the genre. Um, and, and that these are social actions that um, have, have um, consequences for identities, relations, and practices. Okay, so in, in conclusion, I would say that um, a genre is a recognizable text used in social context which organize and shape our relationships with each other and to the world. So again, um, looking ahead, um, hopefully you have already, but if not, go back and do so. I mapped out your discourse community um, in, in this first lesson of the second unit, and that's an activity that I have for you in order to think about um, which discourse communities you are a part of, and um, you know, giving you some ideas perhaps of communities you could look to for the final research project. Um, you're not obligated to study a group like as a group for the final project. You might even must just want to look at one or two uh, people within that group. But um, just to give you an idea of different ways in which you can start uh, uh, thinking about that final research project and how we're members of discourse communities. Um, the second lesson of this unit um, will ask you next to read um, a reading by Irene Clark. This is a bit of a longer reading, similar to the Deborah Brandt. It's a scholarly article. I don't think it's quite as long as the Brandt, but it does have some pretty meaty theoretical ideas that will echo what we did in the PowerPoint here. So be sure to try to leave enough time to give that a good read um, before responding. Okay, so please let me know if you have questions about anything in this unit, and I look forward to reading some of your responses.